Okay, so we've seen how the Fourth and Fifth Amendments were designed to protect the rights of individuals from unreasonable and unfair treatment by law enforcement officials. Now let's turn to Lesson 32, which asks how the Fifth, Sixth, and Eighth Amendments protect rights within the judicial system. Let's begin by addressing this question. Why is procedural justice so important? Procedural justice is arguably the core of why we have the Bill of Rights. Part of what pops up with procedural justice is it suggests to us that we in fact have rule of law and rule by law as opposed to rule by men. Basic concept behind procedural justice is we have a set of rules that we follow before government can do something to you. If government is going to take your life, if government is going to take your property, if government is going to take your liberty, it has to do so based on rules that we know ahead of time. Not based on fiat, but based on rules that we know ahead of time. That's the key behind procedural justice. What the Fifth, Sixth, and Eighth Amendments do is provide for trial rights pr primarily, as well as rights that go to what punishments are appropriate after trial and after guilt has been assessed. When you take all those together and when you add them to some of the Fourth Amendment and Fifth Amendment rights we've talked about before, then you get the full panoply of what is protected. Your ability to be protected from the moment that the government decides that it wants to come after you, collect evidence, from the moment that the government decides that it wants to try you, can't require that you incriminate yourself, into trial rights, right to counsel, no double jeopardy, into rights that exist with respect to what happens to you after guilt, no cruel and unusual punishment, for example. That's procedural due process, that's procedural justice, that's the whole panoply, and that's at the core of the Bill of Rights. Let's look then at the central purposes of the Fifth, Sixth, and Eighth Amendments when taken in totality. How, are the, how do these amendments protect individual rights before trial, like during when someone's indicted or the issue of bail or the right to counsel? How do these amendments affect that? Sure, let's, let's, take, those, let's take those separately. Okay. The, the grand jury and indictment process, the idea behind a, an indictment in a grand jury is that the grand jury is supposed to look over the prosecutor's shoulder. When a prosecutor decides that he or she wants to bring a case against a putative defendant, it needs to go through the process of making sure that it's not being done based on completely irrelevant and insufficient evidence. So the grand jury is supposed to decide in the first instance, is there probable cause to believe that a crime has been committed by the defendant? Very low bar, but the bar is supposed to be there. It's supposed to make sure that the prosecutor has some basis for its decision to try an individual. If the prosecutor cannot provide sufficient evidence to convince a grand jury that it has enough evidence to believe that there's the possibility that an individual may have committed a crime, then the prosecution is at an end. So that's how the indictment process helps uh, individuals before trial. The rules are slightly different in federal courts than in state courts. In federal courts, a felony may proceed by an indictment by grand jury, or in some cases, when the defendant waives indictment, through an information filed by the prosecutor. The information substitutes for an indictment. In state courts, preliminary hearings or other procedures can be used in certain cases to prepare cases for trial without a grand jury indictment. What about bail? Bail is an issue that comes under the Eighth Amendment. The idea behind bail is there may be some circumstances when folks may not show up for trial. So bail is there to provide a financial incentive for the defendant to show up at show up at trial. So the idea is if you have been accused of a crime, if you're going to be if you've been charged with a crime and if you're now in the process of prosecution, we're not going to hold you in jail because that's a little too much like punishment. Instead what we're going to tell you is while you are going through the process, you will be out, but we want to have some monetary way to provide you with an incentive to show up. So bail is there in order to make sure that you show up, but it's not supposed to be excessive. It's not supposed to be a burden. 
Now, the problem that we've run into recently is that any bail can be a little too much for some people out there. And as a consequence, we're going to have to look very hard on the question of how much bail is excessive in circumstances where even a small amount will cause a putative defendant to not be able to get out of jail. What about the right to a, a counsel uh, prior to trial? Right to counsel before trial, absolutely crucial. Reason why it's crucial is if the first time you see your counsel is at trial, it may well be too late. The idea behind counsel is that counsel is supposed to attach at the time that is, that is the earliest possible that it makes sense for you to be required to have counsel. So the idea is you don't just show up at trial and all of a sudden you have counsel. Now the issue behind the right to counsel uh, has been one that has changed over time. It used to be the case that the right to counsel only meant that you had the right to hire counsel and have that counsel show up with you at trial. Under the old common law, the old English common law, there were circumstances where you weren't allowed to have any counsel whatsoever come with you. Now that has morphed a little bit, has morphed a lot. It's not that you are simply allowed to have counsel with you. Now the government needs to provide counsel to you before you can be convicted of particular crimes. The idea is due process requires at least a semblance of a fair fight. And it's not even a semblance of a fair fight if the prosecution has police looking for evidence and has all of the resources standing behind it while an individual shows up in court by him or herself. That's why we require that the government provide counsel to you if you are not sufficiently, if you're too indigent to afford counsel on your own.